Hello SAE Online Master's students, my name is Mike Hill and this is my MPP 704 presentation for Milestone 2. So the focus of my major project for the whole masters is on a particular phenomenon of loudspeaker design. When critically listening to a pair of loudspeakers, it's important to remain in the sweet spot of the listening area. So the sweet spot is directly on axis from the high frequency drivers of the speakers. If you're not on axis, then you'll start to hear the high frequencies shift. And I know what you'll be thinking, surely the high frequencies rolling off off axis isn't going to make that much of an impact. Surely it isn't that much of a big deal. But it's actually quite considerable, and I'll show you that here. This frequency chart shows the response of a D27 tweeter. So on axis, this tweeter is usable between 1.8k and up to 20k. Ideal. We move 30 degrees off axis and our usable frequency response drops off to under 12 kilohertz. And moving on at 60 degrees, we are right down to just above five kilohertz. So if you're standing to the right of the mix engineer when you're in a studio session, the speaker to your left could be between 30 and 60 degrees off axis. So you're losing tremendous amounts of high frequency information from that left speaker when you're listening. Now think of a stereo mix with something like overheads where you have stereo percussion. You're actually losing a lot of that information from the opposite speaker that you're stood on the other side of. So I think that's quite relevant. So on top of this loss of high frequencies off axis, we've got another problem, which for me is the even bigger one, which is that if we're sat in the listening position here, those off axis responses are actually affecting us because they're bouncing off the walls and the reflections that we're getting from the wall are all being impacted by that off-axis coloration. So, not ideal. That's just supposed to be susceptible? No! <laughs> and if you ask me, this sucks. An acoustic instrument doesn't suck though. A performer playing an acoustic instrument like a violin or a flute doesn't have the same problem. Off-axis coloration exists to some extent, but it's it's much more subtle than what we were talking about there. So, if you think of a performer playing an instrument, the sound is projecting in most directions from that instrument. Only if there's physical obstacles in the way are we not hearing high frequencies, particularly, for example, the performer themselves. If you do stand behind a musician, yes, it sounds different, but if you stand 30 degrees or 60 degrees off from a, a, a performer, the frequency response should be pretty uniform. And this is where my master's project was conceived. I wanted to build a loudspeaker that would sound like a performer playing in acoustic space. So I'm trying to design an omnidirectional high frequency system that does absorb behind it, much like as if there's a performer behind the driver.
I want to see if I can make a loudspeaker that sounds like a performer playing in your room. I want to make music reproduction sound like acoustic instruments, not like loudspeakers. I want to make music great again. Okay, let's get back on track. MPP704 is a professional development module. I started by drawing up a professional development plan. This plan is split up into three sections, each with a reflective report. Part 1. I need to develop a crossover that will work in an omnidirectional loudspeaker. I've never built one of these before, therefore I'll need to do a literature review. In order to develop this absorption array, I need to design and build a speaker system with an omnidirectional high frequency output. I've already done a fair amount of research about these in previous modules. Multi-driver arrays, cones, balls, MBL radial strala, and sparrow leg speaker design. Part 3. What's the point in learning if you aren't sharing? Part 3 will be developing a short course in loudspeaker design for students at degree level to get an insight into how to look at loudspeakers analytically and work on their own designs. The literature review on crossovers was wildly informative. I've been building passive crossovers for my DIY speaker builds for the past 10 years. Before that I was working at PMC loudspeakers, building a number of different passive loudspeakers for the high-end hi-fi and studio market. During the last couple of months of working at PMC, Andy Wilson and Oliver Thomas, who were in charge of R&D at that time, were working on a new loudspeaker with a digital crossover. That ended up being the 2-2 series loudspeaker. Although I have used these speakers a lot since their release, including numerous sessions at Evolution Studios in Oxford, I hadn't thought much about the crossover topology. This literature review revealed that passive crossovers are considered legacy technology by many revered electrical engineers, most notably Douglas Self, whose books I've been trying to understand since doing my undergrad. His book, The Design of Active Crossovers, from 2011, really hammers home the benefits of active crossovers over their passive counterparts, and I quote, As we have just seen, active crossovers have a long and convincing list of technical advantages. The score is 22 very real advantages and 5 not so convincing advantages as opposed to 9 advantages for passive crossovers. It is generally accepted that active crossover hi-fi systems sound obviously better than their passive crossover counterparts. Any sort of consensus is rare in the wide field of audio, so this is highly significant. And yes, he explains every single one of those advantages in that chapter. Pretty serious stuff. The literature review then moves on to digital crossovers. There is less information about these currently, but I found some interesting articles from dsp for You and Tortuga Audio. From these I discovered the power of modern DSP solutions. They are able to mimic all of the filters used in active electronic crossovers, but can be changed in any way at any point. I decided it was worth a shot, and picked up a digital crossover of my own. This is the T-Rex DSP 4x4 Mini, an affordable DSP crossover from Toman that claims to perform all of the functions I will require. Fortunately, this unit is fantastic. Balanced inputs and outputs, a ton of flexibility within the software, I can apply filters, EQ curves, delay per driver, there is even the ability to limit the output of each driver independently. It would be nice to have a digital input like an AES EBU on the device, but at this price point I really can't complain. The speaker design and build has been the most challenging part of the project. I have built three pairs of speakers at home before this project, and I've built countless loudspeakers at PMC, but the process is far more elegant in their workshop. You've got no friends. I decided to opt for a cone design. A ball didn't really make sense to me acoustically, a radial strala just looked really complicated, and I figure without a lot of fine tuning the results would probably be pretty bad. I feel like the cone design is the most likely to produce good results 
and let me focus on the absorption, which is actually the main focus of the study. I also just find the sleek lines of the cone aesthetically pleasing. How to build a cone? Right, I designed the speaker on Microsoft Paint. The tweeter would be removable so I could run the speaker in monopole, directional, or in omni with the cone. I went into Photoshop and recreated my cone with 12mm thick MDF. I would cut out circles, stick them together, then sand the circles into a perfect cone. Although in retrospect, this was a seriously optimistic plan. After two days of power sanding, the cone was complete. Now, to design the rest of the speaker system. So firstly I had to choose the drivers for the loudspeaker and decide what kind of cabinet I'm going to go for. Sealed, ported, transmission line, passive radiator. There were, there were a few options there. For the driver, I found an ATC PA75 234 BLC on eBay and I just had to buy it. I love ATC loudspeakers and their drivers are really a key element of why their speakers are just so good. I placed the feel small parameters into WinISD, which is a loudspeaker cabinet simulator tool which provided me with the optimum cabinet volume and allowed me to play with using ports. For the cabinet, I decided to go sealed as the smoother output curve would be easier to manipulate using my digital crossover. Sealed cabinets don't extend as low as ported boxes, but they are fast due to the cabinet air pressure, and they roll off in a very smooth fashion. With my rough drawing in Microsoft Paint, I downloaded a trial of SketchUp, and I learned how to 3D model to scale. I've uploaded a video with the whole 3D build here. Although it was hard to get the hang of, I was amazed after completing the digital build that my practical project went exactly to plan with the digital design, literally to the millimetre. It was so handy being able to try things out, cut holes here and there, move them around, being able to undo mistakes at the push of a button. The speaker took a while to build. I double braced the cabinet with 12mm thick MDF for a durable build with very little resonance. This box is heavy. I cut out the wiring terminal hole and the driver mounting hole with a router and a circle cutting jig. The cabinet is just under 37 litres in volume and is half stuffed with acoustic grade rock wool. This absorbs SPL within the cabinet and brings the total output of the loudspeaker down but with the added benefit of frequency response control. This process requires a lot of patience as it's really trial and error and using your ears and using a measurement microphone. I've been using the Bayer Dynamic MM1 to measure my output. I glued the cone onto the roof of what will be the cone stand. The cone stand was tricky to glue together and still looks a bit precarious now. I certainly won't be sitting on this guy anytime soon. The tweeter cab is just a basic box which gives the tweeter more sonic body. It was hard to recess the driver flush on this one. To finish the loudspeaker, I used an offset router base plate with a rounded router bit in order to give the speaker its soft rounded edges. I sanded the three pieces with 80 grit, 120 grit, 240 grit and finally 1200 grit sandpaper. I then applied sanding sealer because MDF just drinks paint otherwise. I applied two coats of grey primer, then applied two coats of satin black and finally applied a coat of matte lacquer top coat to protect the finish. This probably sounds pretty overkill for just a finish, but honestly I've built three pairs of speakers before and looking back it's always something that you regret, you're so excited to listen to your finished speakers, you give them a lick of paint and you think that'll do, plug them in and you go, and then two years later the finish doesn't hold up, the corners wear out, it's just, it's just such a shame that you've finished some great sounding speakers but the finish doesn't hold up. The loudspeaker design short course is an introduction to loudspeaker design. It's aimed at those who already understand what a loudspeaker is and how it functions. I've created an introduction to this course in another video. You can check that out here. I created a scheme of work which details eight classes taken over eight weeks. This course is designed to be taken online as when I started working on it the COVID-19 virus had just emerged 
and stopped us from making plans in real life. I really hope this virus is just a memory for those of you watching this in the future. Introduction. This eight week course is designed to introduce you to loudspeaker design. It is aimed at students who already have a solid foundation of sound theory and have been introduced to acoustics and psychoacoustics. Through a mix of theoretical and practical sessions, you will be learning how loudspeaker designers make decisions and what compromises must be made in the process. This course is designed to provide you with a deeper understanding of the loudspeakers you work with and the skills and confidence required to design and build your own loudspeakers. This scheme of work was based on the format I was given by Steve McCarthy when I was working at BIM Birmingham. I also want to give a shout out to some of my old SAE colleagues when I was working in Oxford. Gareth Green, Dean McCarthy, and my main man, Keith Hennigan. Cheers guys. This master's project is so good in that you can learn more about exactly what you love. It gives me a legitimate reason to research what I love at a level I just wouldn't be able to justify naturally. Okay, that's enough from me, but thanks for tuning in. And yeah, if you've got any thoughts or comments, just leave one down below for me. Cheers, guys. Oh